Playoff chances finally dead. Sabres fall to New Jersey. Now what? Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I especially want to thank all our listeners for listening to the show throughout this season, throughout this playoff race. The show is so much more fun to do, and we get so much more engagement from the listeners and from fans when the Sabres are good and You've really been able to say that all year long. Um, and they were in it right up until game number 80, but that's where it ends. Game number 80 is where the playoff race comes to an end. The Sabres fall 6-2 to two to the New Jersey Devils. We'll talk some about the game and what went wrong in this game. I don't really think the Sabres actually played all that bad. Uh, we'll go through some of the biggest missed opportunities of the Sabres for uh, this season. What's the the game or the series of games that to you is most frustrating? The, the, the thing that you say when you go, oh, if only they had flipped blank. And I've got a couple of different answers for that. Um, also, what they maybe missed in terms of a trade earlier in the season for this year. Um, so we'll get to that. And then really what's ahead? Uh, I know I will do this a lot as when the season officially ends on Friday night. And come the off season, I mean, we'll be we'll be talking about these things all the time. But just to preview the off season a little bit, I've got. I mean, to me, the off season is going to be pretty clear. Two things that I really want this off season that the Sabers need to address to go from where they are now to playoff team, and that's ahead. So that's going to be in the uh, third segment of today's show. So stay tuned for that. The two things that I think they need and that they have to address in the off season. I got some names for you too, of course. Starting though. Today's show with the game. Sabres fall 6-2 to two to the New Jersey Devils. As I mentioned, I really don't think they played all that poorly. I mean, the Sabres outshot the Devils in this one 38-28. And if you look at the goals, I mean, what do you got here? You got two empty netters right at the end. And you've got one goal that goes in off Yoki Haru's foot. You got two other goals, like they're real goals, of course. And the Sabres had two goals that were real goals. And they had another goal that was called back on an offsides that was offside by like eight inches, if that. You had um, you had Jeff Skinner in the third period try a wraparound that, man, how close did that come to coming in, to going in? It's a, it's a Ryan Graves pins his stick to the post and there's no give on the stick. The puck luck in this game was widely in favor of the New Jersey Devils. The Devils are a great team on top of it. They bury their chances. Jack Hughes and Jesper Bratt, I mean, those two run around sometimes, and it looks like they're 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 from the future, um, just the way they move. They're so in and out, you know, pop, pop, like get in, get out, get shot attempt. Like they are so good, the Devils, and I think they could do some real damage in the playoffs. I look forward to doing my own bracket here on, uh, on the show uh, as we approach playoff time in the next couple of weeks. And I will have the Devils going far. I, g- I can assure you I will have the Devils going far. How far? Maybe I'm kind of letting on that I think they might win two rounds. I, at least I'm going to have them winning a round. They're a great team. Lindy's done a great job. The roster is young. It is talented. It is not not your dad's New Jersey Devils that used to win two to one. This team wins by scoring six. Um, so it's just a tough opponent. It's a tough opponent to have to play in that spot. Uh, Devin Levi, we talked a lot about him on previous shows playing back to back nights and he did. And I thought he did a fine job. I didn't think he was incredible. I didn't think he was terrible. I thought he did a fine job. He was steady. I thought he did better than you probably would have seen from either Uka Pekalukin or Eric Comrie in that game. So Sabres tried, man. Like they they put their effort, they put the effort out there. Tage Thompson, after the Sabres got down by two goals, I noticed him on back to back shifts, just looked like a man possessed. Like I, 
he looked like someone that was on the bench thinking to himself, I am not going to let this team miss the playoffs. It is not happening. And then he went out there and almost scored on back-to-back shifts. Um, but again, it's only so much you can control. Vitek Venacek of the Devils is a really good goaltender. Uh, he was really strong on the night. He was the game's number two star with, star with 36 saves on 38 shots against. And it was sad. I mean, I did the same thing I did on uh, on Monday night, which was Sabre game on the TV. And the out-of-town game that mattered to Buffalo on the computer screen. And on Tuesday, of course, that would have been Pittsburgh versus Chicago. And Pittsburgh, despite being a minus 520 favorite in regulation and having their season be basically on the line, they lose to the worst team in hockey, Chicago, who was starting Nikita Zaitsev, a defenseman at third-line center. That's how bad that Pittsburgh loss was. The Sabres got the, the help. It even makes it all the more frustrating that they got the help they needed on the out-of-town scoreboard. And now we don't care about Islanders and Canadians like we would have on Wednesday night. Um, just kind of how it goes. It's just kind of how it goes. Uh, you know, by the way, I don't know who, if you listen to also the morning show on WGR, um, our Sammy Squares pool that we came up with, he scored, Matias Samuelson scores in the first game that we were talking about this. If you don't know what it is, uh, listen to our morning show from uh, yesterday on WGR. Basically, we're doing a pool for, you got to, you get your own game for Matias Samuelson. And if he scores, then you win the pot. And we didn't start it yet, but it's like, okay, we came up with this idea. And that night he scores his second goal of his NHL career. But anyways, it's neither here nor there. Um, You know, it's just sad, man. And I do have to say, this season meant a lot to me as much as I'm sure it did to any Sabre fan, uh, especially my age. I mean, if you went through the Bills drought and you were kind of in the same age bracket, you might you might get this point. Uh, and it's not to say that it matters more to me than it does to, you know, if you're a 50-year-old Sabre fan or a 15-year-old Sabre fan. Um, but the reason why it meant so much to me was just, it was the first time in this chapter of my life that I've had really the Sabres be a part of it. And, you know, that's not as true for me as it is for some, like just a typical fan, um, because I'm obviously covering the team and I'm, I'm, I'm in the arena a lot. And, you know, especially WGR, I'm covering the team and talking about them on a day-to-day basis. So it always is a part of my life, but caring about them like that. I mean, I missed it. I missed it a ton. Uh, th- having the whole season be that and having the season be fun and not just feeling numb by the time you got to February, not feeling dead inside by the time you got to March. I mean, that was a yearly occurrence with the Sabres. And, you know, the last time I would have cared about them and it cared about, it's not the perfect word, but felt this good about them for this long and had this much fun watching them. I'm in high school. And I mean, again, I've not gone through all of life yet. Uh, I'm only 27 years old, but I I have to imagine one of the biggest changes in your life in like a 10 year span or an 11 year span in this case, actually 12, right? It's 12 now. Oh my God. 12 years is go is from age 15 to age 27. I mean, it's just not, it's not even close. Like I'm doing homework the last time the Sabres are in the playoffs and now I, I'm engaged and I have a house and like, you know, I'm an adult. It's, it's a huge, it's, a, it's completely different, completely different chapters of, of my life that it's like, oh yeah, that's what it felt like. And thinking about the last time I felt like that, it, again, because of the stages of life that I went through, um, just it being happening while I was in my twenties, it feels like eons ago. Again, I don't know that that is, you know, unique to someone of my age, a Sabre fan, my age, but it's one thought I had as I kind of reminisce on the season now. And I know they've got two games left. And I think Thursday night will be fun, by the way. I think Thursday night will be fun. Kind of a thank you from Sabre fans to uh, to their team. And they will be wearing the goat head. It's a hell of a way to end the season. Um, the black and red. It, it, it was just a, fu- it was a fun year. It was a wild ride. They they had ups. They had downs. It was a roller coaster, right? There were times we thought they were dead, and then they'd come right back, and we thought they were in it. They were in a spot for mo- multiple different occurrences throughout the season. And the most in, like we'll, we'll judge we'll, when we do the full postmortem on this season. You know, of course, 
what you'll look at to judge whether or not the season was a success, you'll look at the point total. You'll look at the wins. You'll look at the individual steps taken by individual players. You'll look at Granado. You'll look at the trades. You'll look at the ages of the, of the players. You'll look at the future. You'll look at a lot of things on paper. But one thing that you can't, I guess you could put it on paper, and it would just be ticket sales. Uh, but one thing that really, I think, measures the Sabres' success this year is not that they even came close to the playoffs. It's not that they're going to end up at about 90 points. It's not that Thompson became an MVP. It's it's really, the number one thing is, they got fans back. They brought the fans back. The building is not all the way full again, but it's full again. And there's an atmosphere. And there is a there is a hope. There is a rejuvenation just in Sabre fans when they think about this team. The team is fun to just think about again. You know, like, when I get to the offseason portion of the segment in a couple segments, I'm excited to talk about the off season. I'm excited to talk about what they could add and what they could, what they could be next year. And that has not been the case in past years, really the last 12 or 11 years when the season ends, it's like, Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. I couldn't do it anymore. And then we just forget about them for a month until the NHL draft or two months, because we just can't take it anymore. We can't take thinking about them. We will talk. We'll think about you in June again. Uh, it was like we needed a break from the Sabres. And now it's like you're sad to see them go and you can't wait to see what they do. And you can't wait to talk about what they do and you can't wait for opening night. So to me, that's the number one way to measure the season being success is now the playoff race is over is to look back and think, all right, they brought fans back. And that had to be with, with an empty building and a, a just a quiet, dark, you know, lifeless arena uh, for all their home games to, to do a 180 on that and to be where they're at. I mean, that's the success of the season, but again, I thought they played well in New Jersey, which was again, what the segment was supposed to be more about, but I think the putting it, looking at, look at the larger picture maybe was the, uh, the right way to take that anyway. All right. When we come back, what was the biggest missed opportunity of the season? What really could it, What's the thing you'll be most frustrated about that should have gone differently? And had that gone differently, they would have made the playoffs. Uh, we'll get to that when we come back here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. And we are presented by a Game Time. Uh, excuse me, that's not Game Time. There it is, Game Time. So if you want to go to the game on Thursday, I mean, huge game. Huge game, not huge game in terms of the standings, but it's the final home game. You know, it's the final home game. It's your last chance to to kind of say goodbye in the arena. And, um, you know, Sabre fans, I think, are going to fill up the building. It's going to be energetic. And also could be a Craig Anderson send-off. And you know what? He's only been here two years, but he's the player deserving of a send-off. And if you want to be in the arena for Thursday night's game against Ottawa, go to Game Time. We're buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports music comedy and theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have now the, to me my favorite part about the game time app is you get a perfect view of what you're going to be looking at from your seat when you're scrolling through in fact you don't even have to click on the ticket when you're scrolling through it's almost like it's in the background, almost like a like a watermark, like behind the details of the tickets. Okay, that's what I'm looking at. This is my angle. This is how high up I am. Uh, it's very easy to see and very easy to uh, get a sense of what your seat is going to be like. Puts you right there. Uh, game time. The last the, or is the place for last minute tickets. Forget it. Planning months in advance. Game time is deals and tickets right up to the day of the event. And you get exclusive flash deals and tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and of course, hockey. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code locked on NHL. Gel for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Sneaky Joe DiBiase back here on the Locked On Sabers podcast. Bit of a post mortem, not even quite in the season yet. More just on the playoff race in total, which I guess is kind of the season. Uh, at Sneaky Joe Sports, by the way, at Locked On Sabers to follow us on Twitter and get engaged with the show. Um, 
What was the biggest missed opportunity of the year? The thing that if you flipped it, they make the playoffs. And there's going to be a, you could have a couple different answers. I look forward to hearing listeners' answers to this, either on a Twitter page or on our YouTube comment section. Uh, search Locked on Sabres. Find us on YouTube. I think there's four answers that you could seriously consider. Number one, the the almost like the, the what if. The, oh man, if they had only flipped, if they only done blank. What is that? What is that thing? I think you could have four answers. Number one, the eight game losing streak early on. I'm not even ranking these. I'm just saying one of these four could be your number one answer. The eight game losing streak early on in the season. The Sabres, um, without Matias Samuelson, remember, lost eight games from November 4th through November 19th, including losses to bad teams in there. And they went over a possible 16. They didn't even get one of those games to overtime. And th- we could play the what if game here, right? Like four more points, we think, gets them into a playoff spot if we're looking at it right now. Two and six instead of 0 oh and 16, 0 oh and 8. Or uh, one or two, two, uh, I hate math, two, four, and two. Just you didn't even have to have a good record in there. Just don't go over 16. That might be a lot of people's number one answer. I think that could be your answer. I think losses to really bad teams could be your answer. And I'm thinking about five games in particular. Arizona in November, a 4-1 to loss on November 8th. Uh, Philadelphia twice, including a 4 nothing shutout loss on January 9th. And then the game more recently, um, two to, uh, not 2-1, to one, uh, 5-2 to two on March 17th in Philadelphia. You had a loss to Chicago mixed in there on January 17th in overtime. And then you had a loss to Columbus, of course, that kind of kicked off that recent uh, bad stretch, 5-3 to three at home on February 28th. Five games there against five of the worst teams in hockey. And of that possible 10 points, you got one. That's another way of looking at it. Another frustration. Another, oh, man, how that if they had only blank only beaten instead of none of those five bad teams. How about two, two of those bad teams and they would have made the playoffs. That could be your answer. Not beating bad teams. How about that more recent losing streak? The second time Samuelson missed games from Tuesday, February 28th against Columbus through Tuesday, March 21st against Nashville. It's a 22 day stretch, almost a month, meaningful games in March. They lost 10 of 12. They lost 10 of 12. You couldn't. And that's when the playoff race, like they were in it. They were in it at the beginning of that stretch. And they had to dig out, right? Like they had to win seven of their next nine just to even have a shot at it. That's how bad that previous stretch was without Samuelson. So I think those are your three biggest way, most frustrating ways of looking at the schedule. Eight game losing streak early on, losing 10 of 12 recently, or the five losses to really really bad teams over the course of the season uh Aisha, i should add another one in here that i didn't have written down the home record of course the home record is another way of being very frustrated that they're going to miss the playoffs um fifth or what was their home record this year 16 20 and four just abysmal now one other way i think you could be frustrated that they didn't make a trade earlier in the season and i might even want to go earlier back than that because for me it's goaltender on this front. My biggest frustration is it's always been assumed or treated like the Sabres didn't plan on making the playoffs this year, that this is, this is all they needed. Well, that's fine that this was the bar, but you could have made this year more about the playoffs if you wanted to. And all that really would have been was investing more in goal than you did with Eric Comrie. That's it. Eric Comrie was a goalie that played, and I'm saying this is someone that kind of liked that idea at the time. He was an analytical argument for it. But looking back, you can look and say, okay, big gamble, right? When Craig Anderson is your other goaltender, what was the plan? The plan was for what? Comrie to play 50 games this year and Anderson to play 30? That was the plan? I, I don't I don't like that. So looking back, Comrie is to me the biggest frustration that they didn't make one of these other trades for a goaltender that rated higher. You know, 
last night against New Jersey. There's one of those guys, Vitek Venacek, not a, not even a household name, not a Vesna guy, not a, an incredible number one goaltender, but a good enough goaltender who had played 80 games as opposed to 19, which is what uh, Comrie had been looking at. Venacek had had pretty good success in Washington. 908 save percentage, 41 and 22 record, like a goal saved uh, above expected. That's pretty solid. A quality start percentage about average, like a pretty good goaltender. And he cost New Jersey a second round pick. And then New Jersey gave him a three-year deal for less than $4 million per year, which by the way, funny enough, is exactly the type of goaltender I think the Sabres should be looking for this offseason. They could have already had that guy in-house. And New Jersey did that when they already had Mackenzie Blackwood in the picture, their young goaltender who has been their starter for the last couple of years. And Blackwood got hurt. And, oh, it's okay, because we've got Vitek Vedacek. And he held down the fort, started started 48 games this year, and helped lead the Devils to being top five in the NHL. They could have made that trade. They could have made the Vili Husso trade that Detroit did that cost a third-round pick and signed him to a modest contract. Um, they could have made the Darcy Kemper, you know, signing you probably didn't want to do Jack Campbell same thing but who so Georgia Alex Georgia for Colorado cost a third round pick like they had three different guys that they could have gone after for that type of price and it said they just they landed on Eric Comrie and my hope would be and we'll talk about this more in a second that they they answer the bell and they go for that level of goaltender this coming off season doing to sure up their net that's a frustration because if they had made one of those trades for one of those guys, a Vanacek or a Huso or a Georgiev, those middle of the road starters, they'd be in the playoffs. They'd be in the playoffs. So let me know what your answer is, though. What's the number one thing that you think, oh man, if I if they only had done that, they'd be in, they'd be in the playoffs. Time out here. We come back. Now what? A preview of the offseason. I'm excited to talk about the offseason. We'll do it for at least one segment here. We'll uh, talk We'll talk more about Ottawa and Columbus in the next couple of days. And then we'll go full speed ahead into the offseason uh, after, the, the, after the weekend. All right. Time out. We'll come back. We'll do that. Coming up on the Lockdown Sabres podcast with Joe DiBiase. Welcome back. Sneaky Joe DiBiase here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. The Sabres fall 6-2. to two to the Devils, and their playoff chances are now at zero for the season. Now, of course, a lot of you are going to want to talk about what's next, as I do. That's why I'm putting this segment on the first show when their playoff odds end before they're even done with games. I'm excited about what could be accomplished and what they could do this offseason. I don't think there's going to be a lot of moves in terms of volume, but I think there could be moves that that rate highly uh, in terms of um, how impactful they are. Now, to me, it is pretty simple. If you look at this roster right now, who's up for contracts? There's not a lot of guys, not a lot of important UFAs. In fact, really not many at all. Vinny Hinostroza. You've got Gergensen. You've got a Poso. And we could, we'll talk more about the forward group after the season is over. Um, cause I do think that's worth a, a healthy discussion about what do you do with Gergensen's? What do you do with a Poso? And if they're not here, what kind of player comes in to replace them? Do you just go with the kids? Do you bring in veterans? That'll be a good conversation too, but nothing really needs to happen at forward. Pretty loaded, right? Like of the 12 forwards they had in the lineup last night, remember Victor Olson wasn't even in the lineup. They really don't have to touch it. They could go, they could come right back with the exact 12 forwards they had last year. I think fans would be fine with it. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, and I'll tell you why in a future show, but they would be. To me, there's two things that need to happen. Two things that need to happen. And I'll rank them here one and two in terms of their importance. Number one, definitively, in my opinion, is you've got to add a top four defenseman. Henry Yoki Haru, to keep the playoff odds alive in a big game against the New Jersey Devils, Henry Yokiharu played a total of 22 minutes and three seconds of ice time. That was the fourth most on the team. He was horrible. Absolutely horrible. Giveaways all over the place. I don't even want to, the worst play of the night wasn't even the puck going in off his skate, but giveaways, uh, punts into the neutral zone, missing passes, terrible reads in the offensive zone, not in the right position defensively. Just Yokiharu 
was horrible against the Devils. And he has been so rocky as a second pair defenseman. They got to get better at that spot. They need a better partner for Owen Power. They What they really need, they need to clone Matias Samuelson and put him on the second pair with Owen Power. Find me the closest comparable to Matias Samuelson. Get him here and put him with Owen Power. Bump Henry Okiharu down a pair, and you can have Stillman, Labushkin, and Yokiharu rotate on the third pair if you want. But you got to upgrade that second pair. Darlene and Samuelson, keep that together. And then power, Power's got to have a new partner for the season as a whole. I, I am not as down on Yoki Haru as some. I think he's worthy of being in the lineup. I think he should be a third-pair defenseman on this team. He can't be on their second pair. And even, you know what, like depth, he's a better option than those others, I think, for being having, having to bump up to the top four. But he can't be on the second pair anymore. He can't play this many minutes. I mean, this season, what did Yoki Haru end up averaging on the season? Uh, Yoki Haru for the season averaged 21 minutes and 18 seconds of ice time per night. I, I think next year, your target number for him should be more 18 minutes. Three minutes off per night. And that would be basically the third pair. So that, to me, is number one. I don't have a list of names yet for you. I have one name that could fit, and we could get into this more in depth later. Scott Mayfield is an idea. Uh, future or upcoming UFA defenseman for the New York Islanders. Uh, he's 30 years old, so he's not he's a veteran presence, but he's not that old over the hill. He is a UFA. He is, I, I think, close to Samuelson in terms of the style. He's six foot five. He's 220. He's big. He's physical. Uh, he's a decent puck mover. He plays 21 minutes of ice time per night this year for um the Islanders. He's never been a point producer. In fact, this year's his career high with 23 points and six goals. So maybe Scott Mayfield is an idea, and he's coming up as a UFA. The number two thing the Sabres have to address in the offseason, in my opinion, is a 1B goaltender. It can't be Lukanen that you pair with Devin Levi. It can't be Comrie. They had a full season to prove they're ready to be in that position next year. To me, oh, we'll get more into this later, Devin Levi was amazing. But if I'm a serious team, if the Sabres are going to be a serious team, you don't go all in with your entire playoff chances being residing in a rookie goaltender. I don't care how good the rookie goaltender it is. You pair him with a veteran. You pair him with someone that's accomplished. And if Levi takes the net over, you let him take the net over. But if Levi goes through turbulence at all, which happens to almost every goalie, save like Igor Shosturkin and Andre Vasilevsky, Almost every other, even star goalie, they go through it early in their careers. And if that happens to Levi, who's who's right there ready to, to take a, an extra workload? Who's right there ready to pick up the slack for a month while Levi might be struggling? And then before he gets back into the groove, who is going to do that? Or hell, if Levi were to be injured, for instance, who's ready to take over the net? Nobody on the roster right now. 1B goaltender. I always mention, mention the name Thatcher Demko. I've started wondering a little bit, just a tiny fraction of a bit, about what Mark andre Fleury might be as an idea. I don't think he'd come here, but maybe he would. You know, he was good this year. He was pretty good this year for Minnesota. Uh, played 45 games, and he'll be 38 years old. He is 38 years old. So maybe he'll be cup chasing, and that will be make it tough for the Sabres to get him. Um, Maybe I'm going too far with this, but he's from Quebec. Devin Levi's from Quebec. Fleury is like the guy you would want to groom him up, right? Like and help, to, you know, pair with him for a season. I'm sure the Sabres would love to have him. Um, but to me, like Fleury being a mentor to Levi, I'm usually not a big guy when it comes to that. But goaltender wise, I think that matters. And I think Fleury could be that for Devin Levi. So two Quebec guys, one at the end of their career, one at the end of his career, one at the beginning of his career, both good, right? Fleury's still relatively good. He had a few years in the middle there where it was really bad, but he had a bounce back two years here. Um, I kind of like the Fleury idea. And honestly, 
the Sabres are going to have 20 million in cap space. They're not going to spend it all. And Terry Pagula is a Pittsburgh guy, right? Like he loves his penguins. So would he give Fleury like one year, 7 million? I mean, why not? You're not going to use the cap space anyway. It might be an idea where you get him to open up the, uh, open up the checkbook a little bit. So we'll talk more about goalie ideas though. But that to me has got to be the other thing they address. They cannot go in next year with Levi plus in-house. It's got to be Levi plus an upgrade next to him, uh, is my opinion. And you have a 1A and a 1B goalie situation. Not Levi's your one. I got this two over here and God help us if he's got to play. Don't let don't let it get to that point ever if he does have to play for any reason. All right. It was fun. The hunt was fun. Scoreboard watching was fun, but it's over. All right. We will talk more about Sabres and Senators, though, Thursday. Fan Appreciation Night. Uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that show yet for Fan Appreciation Night. Maybe we'll do some Sabre Awards. it be a, a fun thing to do. I had that idea. So maybe we'll do some Sabre Awards, and um, we'll, we'll have sneaky good bets for Sabres and Senators as well, uh, among other things. So come back tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in throughout the playoff race. And come back tomorrow and uh, throughout the coming weeks and months for some off-season talk, which can be fun as well. Thanks for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Sabres podcast every day. Now we can make your next listen Locked On Game to Game. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NHL with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NHL, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts.